I'm just waiting for Brian to say we're live. And we are live. Okay. Well, welcome everyone to uh, AAC in the Cloud 2020 to our uh, first session of the day. Proud to uh, introduce Sarah Hancock. She's going to be talking about uh, electrical injuries and AAC. And I'm just going to turn the time over to, to Sarah. And uh, Sarah, go ahead and take it away. All right. Today I will be discussing electrical injuries impact on speech and communication. You have my draft of slides, but um, this is an updated one. And I will make these slides available to official conference attendees to download through the AHA conference com website. Technically, I'll be talking about what electrical injury specialists refer to as electrical injury, both the immediate consequences and what specialists refer to as delayed electrical injury, which can happen between six months to more than 10 years after the electrical injury. This is the International Classification of Diseases Billing Code for following up on someone living with electrical injury. We'll examine what we know about physiological causes of electrical injuries sequela on communication and speech by examining complications caused by electroconvulsive therapy. The International Classification of Diseases acknowledges delayed ECT effects. Y843 is the IT code for shock therapy as the cause of abnormal reaction of the patient or of later complication without mention of misadventure at the time of the procedure. As a side note, your questions are incredibly important to me, but because I've scripted out my lecture, I ask that you please submit your questions and comments through the conference Slack channel so that my amazing moderator can gather throughout the presentation so that I can answer them at the end. I sincerely appreciate your willingness to participate in helping people like me gain access to AAC by way of introduction. I'm Sarah Price Hancock. I am a third generation San Diegan. I am an alumni of Ricks College, made famous by Napoleon Dynamite. I graduated with my bachelor's in English from Brigham Young University in 2002. I got my master's in rehabilitation counseling from San Diego State University. I am a nationally certified rehabilitation counselor. I have a graduate level certificate for psychiatric rehabilitation. I taught psychiatric rehabilitation at San Diego State University at the graduate level and worked as a research specialist on federal grants until delayed electrical injury and the aging effects of repetitive traumatic brain injury made working full-time and later part-time impossible. At this time, I am a member of the UK ECT Improving Standards Campaign Group, the stakeholder group for United Kingdom's National Institute for Healthcare and Excellence. I'm a BYU-Idaho professional alumni mentor, TBI program committee member, and TBI peer support specialist curriculum mentor for the state of California's Department of Rehabilitation. I'm also an advisory council member with Disability Rights of California for the protection and advocacy of people with mental illness. Though I volunteer with these institutions, I am not giving this presentation on behalf of them. At this time, I use ProLocal Vortex on a Wigo 10 a device with either the native keyboard or a Bluetooth device. I am in the process of working with my speech language pathologist to begin learning to use a switch because both my spasticity and my weakness are gradually becoming more frequent and more profound. We're also exploring eye tracking options. I will discuss these complications later in my presentation. I am blessed to have had the opportunity to voice bank and create my own voice through a cappella. Gratefully, Team Gleason provided a scholarship to generate a voice like mine. This was no small miracle. 
I believe in miracles. I have seen many in my life. We'll get into some of them later in this presentation. To outline the entire presentation, first, I'll touch on explaining electroconvulsive therapy. Second, I'll explain how ECT causes a repetitive mild to moderate traumatic brain injury. Third, we'll discuss how non-ionizing radiation compounds repetitive traumatic brain injury causing brain stem, trigeminal and vagus nerve dysfunction. Fourth, I will explain speech and communication disorders associated with repetitive traumatic brain injury secondary to the neurological sequela of electrical injury. Fifth, I'll share how alternative argumentative communication can improve quality of life. And six, I will brainstorm considerations that should be made when assessing AAC needs for someone with a history of chronic non-ionizing radiation. Information in this presentation can be used by speech therapists, physiatrists, neurologists and other medical specialists desiring to better understand anyone with a history of repetitive electrical trauma or repetitive, prolonged exposure to pulsed electrical and electromagnetic fields. This includes electricians, welders, veterans and others injured by electricity either on the job or at home. Before I continue, let me preface this information by acknowledging the data presented is gathered from peer-reviewed research, real-world evidence presented in four case studies, and my personal experience living life after ECT. Mm -hmm. Nothing presented in this presentation is medical advice. It is presented for informational purposes only. Mm -hmm. That said, information presented on electroconvulsive therapy may be traumatic to ECT recipients or their loved ones who were not properly consented to treatment. For that, I genuinely apologize and acknowledge ongoing efforts to improve informed consent to better understand the long-term electric and electromagnetic fields known as ionizing radiation. My presentation will focus on people with a history of electroconvulsive therapy, or ECT, also known as shock treatment. Mm -hmm. Looking at people with a history of ECT and transcranial magnetic stimulation to better understand non-ionizing radiation was first recommended 20 years ago by the United Kingdom's National Radiological Protection Board. Their advisory group on... Scott. Hmm. Um, I'm speaking too fast. Okay. Uh, I, I understand you. Okay. Then I will continue. Um, <laughs> if anyone in the Slack channel feels that they don't understand, let us, let me know. But until then, she's going to be... I continue. Um, I noticed the closed captioning. Not I, being able to keep up? No. So I will continue and make sure that when I record this presentation for you. I will make sure the closed captioning works. And I apologize to people depending on closed captioning because I depend on it and have many friends who do. So please accept my apology. It will be fixed later. Currently there are no um no one is complaining in Slack about it. So uh, I will, I will, 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 will ask you to slow down, but uh, so far, so good. Uh, Thank you. Their advisory group on non-ionizing radiation published a report entitled Electromagnetic Fields and Neurodegenerative Disease. 
This report reports how people with chronic exposure to pulsed non-ionizing radiation have a higher rate of subsequently developing amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Parkinsonism and Alzheimer's. Information linking pulsed high electric fields and the subsequent development of ALS was highlighted in 2007 at a United States congressional hearing on Gulf War syndrome. At that hearing, the late United States Air Force Brigadier General Thomas Mikolajczyk testified of his developing ALS after repeated lengthy exposure to pulsed, non-ionizing radiation as a pilot in the Gulf War. <coughs> he petitioned U.S. Congress to study the connection between repeated electrical injury, prolonged electromagnetic exposure, and the subsequent development of amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS. From what I've witnessed, the heterogeneity is diverse. Without specialized training in electrical injury, symptoms can be as baffling for medical and rehabilitation providers as they are for the people living with these progressive symptoms. EI's neurological sequelae has a unique prodromal ALS symptom manifestation. Mm -hmm. The late General Mick, as his colleagues called him, said, quote, if these soldiers were dying in the field rather than quietly at home as a consequence of their service, we would leave no stone unturned. We would use the best existing resources and programs to make sure they had whatever they needed to survive. Mm -hmm. End quote. His powerful testimony at the congressional hearing caused the committee to propose the creation of a registry of people who have had ECT, TMS, and vocational or domestic exposure to non-ionizing radiation in an effort to better understand long-term consequences. Fifteen years later, that registry has not yet been created. Consider his plea. If our most esteemed and powerful service members face barriers to helpful interventions when they later develop delayed electrical injury, the barriers faced by common people are even greater. For example, to my knowledge, which directly addresses how chronic exposure to non-ionizing radiation subsequently impacts speech and communication. For that reason, I'd like to dedicate my presentation on chronic electrical injuries impact on speech and communication to the late General Mick, as his colleagues called him. I choose to answer his call to arms. I also dedicate this presentation to anyone with a history of electrical injury struggling to gain access to desperately needed rehabilitation interventions, in particular, my late great-grandma Ruby and my colleagues and peers living life after ECT. I'm especially grateful to Cough Drop for the invitation to present on electrical injury and communication, speech, disorders. I agree with Cough Drop's mission, everyone deserves a voice. The information presented here can be used to better understand anyone with a history of chronic exposure to non-ionizing radiation. This includes people who work as electricians, welders, modern combat veterans recipients of TMS and ECT, Non-ionizing radiation is likely a new term for you. I know it was for me. So what is non-ionizing radiation and how can we be exposed to it? This graphic, created by Aaron D. Franklin, a professor of electrical and computer engineering and chemistry at Duke University, shows the electromagnetic spectrum and its sources in our daily lives. Obviously we're all exposed to it to some degree, some of us more than others. There is an entire spectrum of exposure and consequently an entire spectrum of how non-ionizing radiation can impact speech and communication. Going forward, I will occasionally refer to pulsed high electrical and electromagnetic fields by their common name non-ionizing radiation, so that you can become more familiar with the term. Hopefully this presentation will help better understand why the FDA now requires all patients be forewarned that Quote, long-term safety and effectiveness of ECT treatment has not been demonstrated, and long-term follow-up may be necessary, end quote. But what does that mean? What does long-term follow-up look like? Why is it necessary, and who is qualified to give it? In breaking down the potential immediate and long-term speech and communication consequences of repetitive electrical injury and prolonged electromagnetic exposures, we'll focus on six of shock treatments many manufacturer acknowledge serious adverse events, cognition and memory impairment, brain injury, general motor dysfunction, neurological symptoms, visual disturbance, and auditory complications. The rate of occurrence amongst ECT recipients is unknown because modern standard practice does not require routinely measuring functional changes in every ECT recipient. 
Presently, the MSI and MOCA are the only recommended assessments for ECT recipients, but all speech pathologists know it takes finer assessments to identify subtle speech and communication challenges. So let's begin. What is electroconvulsive therapy, ECT or shock treatment? It's a psychiatric treatment involving rapidly pulsing a high electric field through the brain for up to eight seconds to trigger a tonic-clonic, general motor seizure. It is used to treat a variety of psychiatric disorders when other treatments haven't worked. Many of you may be surprised to hear that shock treatment is still widely used in America and worldwide. You may think it doesn't happen very often. You might be even more surprised to learn it's regaining favor in American psychiatric hospitals. Previously, it was used only in dire situation, but now it's used any time a psychiatrist feels a patient could benefit from it. It's extremely difficult to know exactly how many people get ECT in America each year and how many treatments each patient has, because unlike prescription drug use, there is no designated agency, federal agency routinely auditing prescribed exposure to non-ionizing radiation. How many people have ECT yearly? Harold Sakim, one of the leading ECT researchers, has the answer, disclosed as a forensic expert witness in a court deposition. Uh, I'm not sure if we were supposed to hear that, but we didn't hear that. Oh, how do and, I? Uh, I'm not sure. I think. Uh, Let's see. Let me access it through um, YouTube. That'll work. There was also a there was also a comment in Slack from somebody saying they couldn't quite hear. Wanted to know if you could do sentence by sentence in your app. I don't know if you have the ability to do that or not. To do what? Uh, sentence by sentence in your app because they're having a hard time. Oh. It's a little bit. It's a little bit uh, fast for them. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi. I'm an American English speech synthesis voice from a cappella. Is that better? Yeah. I think uh, a little more. So I speak very slow. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how to find this. Um. <sighs> 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 Bear for your bear. Let's try it again.
Yeah, so uh, I I can't hear it. Um, I'm assuming it's a it's a preference in your Zoom before you start, but uh, maybe maybe at the end when you go to Slack, you can you can tell us where to find it or something. Um, <sighs> at the end of the presentation. What sound it? Huh? <laughs> oh, where does it go? Or... Uh, the question is how many people have shock treatment? Uh, what I do know is that probably about two million people receive ECT every year. And, you know, so. Two a million a year? Yeah, across the world, yeah. You say you know that. You know the two million people. I said I estimate that. We heard that. It's a lot. the UK's independent revealed the scale of electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, prescribed disproportionately to women who make up two-thirds of patients receiving the treatment. In America, no one keeps track, as I mentioned previously, but more than a decade ago, researchers in California identified that more than 70% of the people receiving shock treatment are women with a median age in their mid-50s. At that time, ECT wasn't FDA approved for kids. But in 2018, the FDA approved its use on children 13 years and older. Since then, there's been a 34% increase in American hospitals providing ECT. Back in 1978, the FDA grandfathered ECT device approval without modern pre-market approval safety testing to establish electrical dosing protocols and treatment limits based on safety testing. Consequently, in 2022, both device manufacturers are facing multiple legal cases, so many that one manufacturer filed for bankruptcy after losing product liability insurance. The other shows to publish a regulatory update to the user manual identifying risk of what the manufacturer refers to as, quote, permanent brain damage and permanent memory loss, end quote. They also updated their cautions and warnings statement to warn ECT providers that it's the provider's responsibility to warn of brain injury, difficulties returning to work and all other manufacturer recognized serious risks. So how does one safeguard against those risks? That is challenging. ECT has more than 12 admin technique variables. These variables include things which should be taken into consideration when evaluating anyone with a history of repeated, prolonged non-ionizing radiation exposure. Let's take a look at ECT's device settings to understand what goes into generating the pulse non-ionizing radiation. Current strength is fixed at either 800 or 900 milliamps, depending on the device. Quote, such fixed amplitude values lack any clinical or scientific rationale, end quote. It has no officially recognized dosing protocols. Guidelines are open to interpretation. Consequently, Recipient outcomes land on a spectrum ranging from short-term success to death and everything in between. Let's look at some of the other variables involved to better understand how they relate to other kinds of electrical injuries and their broad outcome spectrum. 
Independent device settings include pulse width, pulse type, frequency, charge, voltage, which is between 250 and 450 volts. The final independent device variable is the percentage of power which can be dialed from 0 to 100%. Together these variables determine how long the fixed current is pulsed through the brain, depending on settings. 900 milliampere as could be pulsed in hundreds or more than 1,000 pulses through the brain and nervous system for up to 8 seconds. What medications are in the patient's bloodstream during the stimulus also influence how non-ionizing radiation impacts the brain and nervous system. Unlike vocational or domestic settings where people get shocked, doctors can control where the electrodes are placed. Conventional shock treatment is bilateral electrode placement. Unilateral can also be used. The preferred dilia electrode placement puts an electrode directly over the trigeminal cardiac nerve. I will return to this later. In bilateral electrode placement, the charge's focus is the anterior of the frontal lobes and brain stem. Additional variables doctors can control which aren't controlled in domestic or vocational settings include how much electricity was given to a patient compared to the dose needed to cause a seizure. Though some believe doctors use just enough stimulus to cause a tonic-clonic seizure, the American Psychiatric Association's textbook the practice of electroconvulsive therapy advises between two and a half and six times the electrical field strength required to cause a seizure, and 10 to 20 times the necessary stimulus in patients taking anti-seizure, mood stabilizers or other medications which alter a patient's ability to seize. Unlike in electrical injuries on the job, in the home or out in the community, Doctors can control of the length of time between treatments. In America, a standard index course is 10 to 12 treatments, typically given three times a week for two weeks, then twice a week for two weeks, and then once a week for two weeks. The doctor can control the length of time between treatments and the number of treatments a person endures. According to one of the most published DCT researchers, Harold Sakim, people who don't respond to psychiatric treatments are less likely to respond to ECT. <coughs> he said more than 90% of ECT recipients relapse within eight days. For that reason, he recommends what's referred to as maintenance ECT. Though some studies advise spreading out maintenance treatments, some doctors, like mine, choose to give back-to-back -back index courses of three times a week as described previously. That's common without dosing protocols or dosing limits on record with the FDA or any other international medical device regulator. As mentioned previously, the device can pulse current for up to eight seconds. The purpose of ECT is to trigger a seizure. Everyone reacts to pulsed high electric fields differently. Some people estimate seizures last between 25 seconds and two minutes. Doctors cannot control how long the seizure lasts, nor can they control how long the brain activity halts before resuming in coma activity. We'll discuss this later when we discuss electric shocks brain injury. Just like an electrician or welder cannot anticipate how many shocks they will receive over the course of their career, when ECT recipients ask how many times ECT treatments a patient has, Shelley coleman -Hoff, director of medical services at Virginia's Dominion Hospital, gives an honest answer. She says, quote, one of the questions that my team and I frequently get actually always get is how many treatments do I have to have before I feel better? Now, if you ask our ECT physician that question, his response will be as many as it takes plus one. End quote HTTPS slash slash four. That's the YouTube video where she says it.
American CCT recipients begin treatment expecting 8 to 12 treatments, but because improvement only lasts for as long as the patient has the treatment, ECT is one of the few medical treatments where Medicare and Medicaid do not have fixed limits on the number of treatments a patient can receive in a, <coughs> or in a lifetime. Consequently, I had 116 treatments before I quit again medical advice. While that may seem like an unusually high number of treatments, there are American ECT recipients in our online support group that have had more than 200 and some who had more than 300. Recently in Connecticut, an ECT recipient contacted Disability Rights of Connecticut to get help and in court mandated shock treatment. They discovered she had more than 500 treatments in five years. Begging the question at what point does a doctor determine treatment should be discontinued? Though some studies advise spreading out maintenance treatments, some doctors, like mine, choose to give back-to-back -back index courses of three times a week as described previously. That's common without dosing protocols or dosing limits on record with the FDA or any other international medical device regulator. Returning to electrical injury variables, environmental conditions are ones which no one can control, not even doctors in controlled settings. Please pay particular attention to these variables when working with any person living with non-ionizing radiation injury. A simple explanation for why there are so many different outcomes <coughs> on ECT recipients outside all the treatment variables is simply the size and shape of the person's head and the length and size of their body. Historically, women have worse cognitive consequences from ECT than men. Looking at computer-generated treatments, it's easy to see how the exact same dose can impact people with varying head shapes and head sizes differently. One, perhaps part of the reason women have worse cognitive outcomes than men is because women's brains are about 11% smaller than men's in proportion to their body size. Smaller brains allow certain features such as a slightly higher ratio of gray matter to white matter and a higher ratio of connections between versus within cerebral hemispheres. Massive study reveals few differences between men's and women's brains. Neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hopefully researchers choose to answer general mixed call to audit long-term ECT outcomes. In so doing, they will begin to recognize how repetitive traumatic brain injury via repetitive electrical injury has greater long-term risks than those identified presently recognized. Earlier this year, researchers audited 20 years of ECT Medicare data and discovered that patients with more than 10 treatments have more than double the risk of developing ALS before age 65. That risk tripled in patients older than 65 who had 10 or more <coughs> treatments. These findings are consistent with another population, veterans. Veterans are twice as likely to develop amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, in comparison to those who have not served in the military. This raises questions about access to speech and other rehabilitation and supportive interventions for all demographics with a more than double, even triple the rate of ALS. If more than 10 ACT treatments, a single, standard index course, more than doubles ALS risk, why are the neurological consequences we experience unrecognized by our medical community? The answer is simple. Electrical injuries, neuropathology, histopathology, and diffuse electrical injury and delayed electrical injury are not required study for doctors, not even doctors using high electric field strength to treat patients. This explains why women and men with a history of ECT and electrical injury have difficulties obtaining access to referrals, speech communication disorders, and AAC, 
likely because our injuries and symptoms are not well recognized or understood. It's important to acknowledge the study on ECT and ALS did not assess for the other neurodegenerative disorders identified by UK's advisory board on non-ionizing radiation. Nor did it identify all neurodegenerative diseases diagnosed in people with a history of ECT. I personally have been diagnosed with my neural disorder unspecified. This photo of me at the beach was taken in 2019 after experiencing symptoms of delayed electrical injury for two years. Note I do not have an AAC device, though living with profound episodic dysarthria. Last month, a man in Australia reported his mother died earlier this year from a degenerative brain disease called progressive supranuclear palsy. He believes the disease was caused by the electroconvulsive therapy. Note, she does not have an AAC device mounted on her wheelchair, though PSP can have a speech slash language variant. I have a friend who later developed muscular sclerosis. Several survivors in our Facebook support group have been diagnosed in their 30s and 40s with early onset dementia. We also have people who now live with cervical dystonia, laryngospasm, and clinical symptom manifestation of many episodic paroxysmal neuromuscular disorders. Doctors and rehabilitation providers familiar with electrical injuries, rare episodic paroxysmal neuromuscular disorders are few and far between. There are only two rehabilitation facilities in North America for people living with a history of electrical injury, Toronto's St. John Rehabilitation Center at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, which receives funding from a variety of sources including Electrical Contractors Association of Alberta. In America, we have Chicago's Electrical Trauma Rehabilitation Institute. The problem is, once a person begins experiencing delayed electrical injury, they aren't familiar with these resources, nor do many have the capacity to relocate to one of these fine institutions. Diagnosing delayed electrical injury requires careful, lengthy documentation of symptoms because injuries occur at a cellular level and are not seen on standard scans. Some doctors believe that if you cannot see a large structural injury on a brain scan, then there is no injury. But doctors who specialize in electrical injury know better. Take, for example, Dr. Mark Jesch, Senior Scientist, Biological Sciences, Tory Trauma Research Program, Sunnybrook Research Institute, SRI, Chair in Burn Research, and the soon-to-be-retired director, Ross Tilly Burn Center, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. I'd like to thank Dr. Jeshk for his tireless efforts on behalf of people with a history of electrical injuries and congratulate him on his retirement. Together, he, myself and Dr. Beatrice Gollum of the University of California, San Diego, are working on a paper formally identifying electrical injury as the cause of acquired shunnelopathies. You can see one of Dr. Chesk's full-length presentations on electrical injury on the Life After ECT website. <laughs> This is Lumen, the first device for hacking your metabolism. With just one breath, Lumen A lot of people don't appreciate the fact that electrical injuries can have severe consequences. And worsening and make it even more difficult is the fact you run all these tests and all these tests come back normal. And somebody has often an electrical injury, has headaches or migraines, you do an MRI, you do an EEG, and you don't see anything. And everybody's like, well, we don't see anything. It must be fake. It must be made up. It's not existing. Well, but that's the problem. It's not. It's real. And our tests are not adequate to detect what happens after electrical injury. And I've seen patients that are tremendously debilitated. They can't walk. They can't speak. They can't eat. Their left side of their body is or right side is paralyzed. 
They can't uh, eat any food anymore. They have migraines. They can focus. They can sleep. They have no energy. They do take two steps and they're exhausted. They have uh, they have seizures. So I can give you a battery of symptoms of 80, 90, 100 symptoms. And if you ask somebody who is not educated and not aware about what electrical injuries can do, they will all look at you as like, ah, let's do some tests. Let's run this battery of tests. And it all comes negative. And they were like, well, no, it doesn't exist. And this is the challenge the electrical community faces, the recognition that it is an injury pattern that can't be detected and only somebody who is educated and experienced in this area can make this call. So we made massive improvement on that. Why? And I will explain and I will translate. communicate by passing approximately 2-4 million mirrors electric current back and forth. When the body is exposed to greater than 2-4 milliamps, the body is built with self-preservation mechanisms in place. Electric current that is stronger than 2-4 milliamps will be diffused along the nerves in what I can only describe as an arching ionic tidal wave. Electrical injury has the strongest impact on nerves and muscles in the immediate location of the shock, but because nerves are designed to conduct electric current and will automatically push extra current along the nerve to diffuse the energy, this is known as diffuse electrical injury. It causes damage to more than directly under where the person was shocked. I will show you some computer generated examples of diffuse electrical injury later in this presentation. Electrical injury can be caused by pulsing significantly more current through a nerve designed to carry than 2-4 milliamps current. It can be caused in a flash, which is just a millisecond, of a high field of electric strength, or it can be caused by prolonged, lengthy exposure to a medium field of electric strength. Small electrical fields are not known to cause any damage, but it sure does fun things to your hair. <laughs> Repeated exposure to pulse, high energy fields, changes how the body uses sodium, potassium, calcium, other electrolytes and ions. The body transfers electronic messages across cell membranes by exchanging electrolytes through voltage-gated ion channels. This disrupts how messages are passed along the nervous system. Electrical injury changes ion <coughs> channel function, causing acquired shunilopathies. Gradually, the body loses ability to regulate electrolytes. Shunilopathies cause episodes depending on which electrolyte the body is struggling to process. Symptoms can include a broad spectrum of sudden onset events including migraine, seizure, paralysis on one side of the body, tetany seizures, full body weakness, writhing movements, muscle spasms, muscle twitching, involuntary muscle movements and cardiac arrhythmia. Symptoms can resolve as quickly as they hit, sometimes they last for several minutes, other times several days, depending upon how long it takes the body to regain homeostasis. Over time, there is a progressive loss of ion channel function in electrical injury patients. Episodes happen Elect more frequently and people begin losing the ability to fully recover after an episode, 
We don't know if that's because ion channels continue to deteriorate, or if it's because with the loss of regulation, surrounding cells slowly lose capacity to regulate ion channels. It may be a combination of both. Electroperation is... <clears throat> Uh, or Electroporation is what happens when cell membranes are exposed to rapidly pulsed, medium or high electric fields. It creates tiny holes in the cell membrane. This allows anything outside the cell to get into the cell. During ECT, this allows medicine and anything else in the bloodstream to be delivered at the cellular level, amplifying effects. Where the electrical fields are strongest, pores are too large to heal. These holes cause the cells to leak like a sinking ship. The cells take on water and lose their contents. Though they try to keep up, eventually they cannot, and cells die. This is referred to as irreversible electroporation. Initial damage is isolated to the path that receives the highest electrical fields. As time progresses, surrounding cells, previously dependent on damaged cells, no longer receive nutrition, pulses, or oxygen. Slowly cells starve and begin to die off, causing additional degeneration. Though typically used for tumor ablation, one article on brain cancer treatment explained they chose to use the low end of electric field parameters outlined in the American Psychiatric Association's Electroconvulsive Therapy Handbook. When I read that, I stared, in disbelief, thinking about my own brain stem. 900 milliamps pulsed through it, more than 100 times, rupturing chronic microbleeding in the central pontine area. Ion channels work to exchange electrolytes and other ions. Mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell, but can you say that you've seen them? In the last few years, it's become possible. This is Professor Grant Jensen, BYU Dean of Physical and Mathematical Sciences. He uses electron microscopes to see how cells work. At this time, he doesn't yet study electrical injury, but I'd sure like to talk to him about it. Here's why. The famous physicist Richard Feynman, he said, it's very easy to solve many of these fundamental biological questions. You just look at the thing. I like that quote because it's true. Sometimes getting a picture really reveals how it works. Electron cryotomography is a pretty new technique which allows us to take 3D pictures of cells. Early in my career, I had the opportunity to start applying that technology to entire cells and had the privilege of using a very expensive instrument. This is a picture of the electron microscope that we used. It fills a whole room. And a lot of our work was involved in figuring out how to use it to get the most out of the pictures. There's different ways of freezing cells and taking the data and processing the data. And my lab did a lot of work in developing those methods. There.
Electrolyte shifts happen all day every day. Cellular ion channels work hard all day every day to pass messages in the form of ions back and forth from one another. Changes in hydration, metabolizing food and drink, hormones, temperature, barometric pressure, and air quality all impact the ebb and flow of ion transmissions through ion channels. When ion channels struggle to function well, nervous system activity is compromised, short-circuited if you will, and episodic paroxysm and neuromuscular symptoms can arise, altering muscle tone, strength and coordination. But how are electrical injuries classified as brain injuries? The answer may surprise you. Let's talk well, about it mild to moderate, traumatic. Others exposed to repetitive, prolonged, intense. Uh, or Oh, boy. Huh. Oh. Let's see. Oh. Boy, I have lost my place. Okay. I wasn't expecting my slide to talk. It is copied from a different one. I'm genuinely curious what my brain will look like at autopsy under a microscope. So, how can we better understand the damage caused by repeatedly exposing the brain and nervous system to high electric fields? I'd like to... I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Bennett Omalu. He's a forensic neuropathologist. The coroner, who first identified chronic traumatic encephalopathy in American football players. Will Smith played him in the movie Concussion. For decades, our nation's football players were told that repetitive concussions and subconcussive events did not have long-term consequences. Thanks to the work of Dr. Bennett Omalu, we now understand that even repetitive mild traumatic brain injuries have a cumulative effect. 
Dr. Omalu explained DCT injury during a brain injury advisory board meeting for the state of California's Department of Rehabilitation. He confirmed that repetitive head trauma causes functional injuries that aren't readily seen on standard brain scans, but that the neuropathology of electrical injury in people with a history of ECT is easily recognized under a microscope. He said it causes extensive functional changes which must be considered in the context of both an electrical injury and repetitive head trauma. He explained, mm -hmm. the natural laws governing electricity do not change based on a doctor's intent. Let's take his advice. How does electrical injury cause a brain injury? Using more electricity than the nervous system is designed to use causes a seizure so violent that it consumes all the brain's energy, shutting off all brain activity until the brain can recover. In ECT, brain activity silence, referred to as post suppression, happens after the seizure. Doctors cannot control how long the brain turns off. Everyone responds differently to such high electric fields. Some people's brain activity stops for as little as 22 seconds. Other people, exposed to the exact same electric field, have no absence of brain activity for 6 minutes and 40 seconds. Without brain activity, the lungs are not pumping oxygen through the brain, and the brainstem's ability to regulate heart rate is compromised. Electricians, welders, combat veterans and other people with electrical injury typically don't have someone next to them hooking up an EEG and measuring brain activity after an electric shock induces a seizure. It's critical to understand that without oxygen and with acutely slowed heart rate, it only takes four minutes for the brain to suffer brain damage. You may be surprised to learn that ECT medical devices are equipped with EEG which measures how long seizure activity lasts and then automatically turns off when the seizure ends. Doctors are not required to document how long brain activity silence and coma lasted. It varies in every patient. The same patient can theoretically have a different amount of time of brain activity silence during every single treatment, based on the variables mentioned previously. During ECT, the patient has an oxygen mask on, but there's no brain activity to breathe it in, and respiratory muscles are paralyzed without mechanical support to inflate the lungs properly until the paralytic wears off completely. Without oxygen circulation and erratic perfusion, cell death begins at four minutes. This is an anoxic brain injury. Paralytics used in ECT impact respiratory muscles and take between four and ten minutes for the half-life to pass, depending on the patient. Insufficient oxygen causes hypoxic brain injury. One ECT survivor, a college of mine, had ADCT treatments in 2001, when she was 25. Last month she finally gained access to a specialized functional MRI used to measure repetitive brain injuries. This specialized scan is called functional neurocognitive imaging. Now, as a 46-year-old female, these are her results. To hear her speak, Undiscerning doctors and allied health professionals might not recognize that she lives with cognitive communication disorder. On this scan, green is normal functioning. Look how hard her brain had to work in order to complete the verbal fluency category test. The screen on the left shows functional neurocognitive imaging 20 years after electroconvulsive therapy. The screen on the right shows functional neurocognitive imaging after two weeks intensive EPIC TBI treatment program using a multidisciplinary approach to post-concussion symptoms. As you can see, intensive multidisciplinary rehabilitation is can improve neurocognitive functioning and quality of life. How can electrical injury impact communication? First, Please remember not all electrical injuries are the same. 
so people with electrical injury may or may not develop a variety of speech and communication disorders immediately after the injury or later when delayed electrical injury develops. A very obvious site involved by stimulation during ECT is the trigeminal area, which is located directly beneath the right electrode in the delia placement. It would certainly be of no surprise that a current flow of 900 milliampere and a frequency of typically 10 to 70 hertz lead to a massive irritation of the trigeminal nerve. Chronic irritation to any nerve alters conductivity of that nerve and the surrounding nerves due to diffused electrical injury, altering function not only of that nerve, but of the surrounding ones as well. The trigeminal nerve and vagal nerve are both impacted by ECT. These nerves regulate how the body receives sensory input. How does electrical injury affect speech and communication? Remember when I said that high electric fields cause a tidal wave of energy to flow away from the electrical contact? Energy crammed into a smaller space can potentially cause more significant microstructural damage. Consequently, head, mouth, tongue, and neck, size and shape play a significant role in a person's subsequently developing speech disorders with the onset of delayed electrical injury. Given all the variables involved in electrical injury and the episodic nature of symptoms, literally no two people with present in the clinic with precisely the same symptom manifestation. For that reason, symptoms must be carefully tracked over time. This is an example of how my ability to communicate shifts with changes in electrolytes. Mm -hmm. Let's find a way to step into our shoes without using our hands. That's where the idea started. <laughs> This is a different example of how my This is a different example of how my ability to communicate shifts with changes in electrolytes. This is a hey Sarah, I see the this session's going to cut off in about five minutes. Um, I know you've got some time, or you still got time left, but I think you said you're going to re record it. Um, <laughs> What? So the the recording's gonna cut off in about uh, five minutes. Oh, um, let's see. So I know you've still got several slides, or I don't know if there's some some good ones that uh, there's some ones that you can go through or whatever, but. <laughs> Oh. I put you on the spot on that one. Oh. 
technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. huh. You got a lot of Zoom, or Zoom conferences, huh? <sighs> This is a fascinating one. Oh, so, mm, this is, let's see. Be, basically, I personally have been diagnosed with Cognitive communication disorder. Disorder. Episodic anarthria. And episodic verbal apraxia. And these are things to consider in choosing an appropriate AAC device as um, adults with acquired brain injury, our needs are <laughs> Unique from children with little language. And we also have, might have visual processing disorders. So the colors on the device will be critical to our ability to use it and also the device needs to be something that emits as little ionizing radiation as possible. So using corded things and corded keyboards and switches. And I personally cannot use infrared eye tracking as the longer I in front of the computer with infrared, the horror it gets to breathe as well. Oh, I have so many other slides, but oh. I'm sorry. So, this is your call to action. <laughs> you can read it. And thank you. Thank you very much. What operation am yeah, my bird with you about my wearing?
So it's been fascinating. Um, I actually personally know a uh, few people who are doing the ECT that uh, I was unaware of until um, lately. So I, I didn't realize it was that popular. So uh, these are good things to get good things to be aware of. And so this has been a, a great presentation. And um, we do have the, the whole presentation in the handouts. If anybody wants to go in and uh, print it off and see some of the things they they um, missed. And it's unfortunate we missed a few slides because there were some other things that were really great in there. But we appreciate Sarah's time to present. And there are a few questions that I saw in the Slack channel. So if you want to go through and, and answer them um, when you have a minute, that would be great. And uh, we, appreciate, uh, we appreciate you uh, sharing with us in our, our AAC in the cloud. And uh, 